Good evening and welcome to this edition of Beers and Bites with your co-host Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdashaw of Fortify 24 by 7. This evening's special guest, we've got Bergahel and Michael Rezik from Acedian. Now, Michael is the VP of Development and Cybersecurity Strategy. Whoa, right? And Brigant is the director for the channel. So what we're hoping to hear tonight is a whole lot, a lot of information about why from the whole realm of networking, I believe, right? That Acedian and what they can do for clients and more importantly, how it all ties together with other products into the cybersecurity industry. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael first. And if you could please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your role and what you do. And then Brigant, uh, we'll do that. And before, do beer. Tell the show is beer. before we do that, <laughs> again, these guys are anxious to start drinking. You know, that's, that's okay. Before we do that, we're going to start off and ask Chris to please show his beer for this evening. Hey, all right. I, I, I'm doubling up on uh, two silos, which is a local brew. The, I brought the Mosaic Goat in case I need it, and I always tend to need it. But I'm going to start off with uh, Planet Judea, which, of course, is a Spaceballs reference. So it had to be bought. Wouldn't it be Druidia? <laughs> Druidia, you're right. <laughs> yeah, my nerd is showing there. All right, so Jeremy, please show your beer. Hey, I like like Chris, I always bring two. Um, I got the uh, Two Hearted Ale, which is uh, from Bell's. It's an American IPA. It's got this cool little, I don't know, salmon or trout thingy on there. And then I've got the good uh, Ale Smith uh, West Coast IPA, West Coast, Best Coast. There you go. And forgot if you could show your beer this evening. I've got a, uh, this is a Sierra Nevada uh, Pale Ale IPA beer. Uh, I picked it because I really like the can. It's got a nice picture of the, uh, of the mountains here, but the beer is actually pretty good. So, and I only brought one, so. Uh, I hear that. And, you know, Michael amongst us is probably more refined against oh, us. Afterwards. I'm the prima donna. Right, the so he, he, He's brought the wine. So, Michael, so, talk, talk about your wine. I'm the prima donna. I've got myself a Spanish and Oravera. Now, I will, I will say that the first time I ever had this wine, I was actually in Barcelona, oh, and I had yeah. it there. Uh, and uh, I was there with uh, for a Mobile World Congress a couple of years ago, and then I found it in the states, and now I, I buy it by the case. So, uh, but next time I'm going to have to, you know, find a good French, uh, French Canadian beer. And uh, bring it to the call. Do they there actually have go. beer in Canada? So, yeah, I think they have beer up here somewhere. I think they allow. Uh, now, we did have a gent on from the UK who reminded us that it's not beer unless he can stick his fork in it and stand straight up. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty <laughs> true. All <laughs> right, so this yeah. evening I brought a, uh, a moonwalk, right? Oh, that's, wow, uh, very appropriate well. for uh, the SpaceX uh, this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so with that, uh, let's start off, Michael, if we can uh, hear a little bit about you and the company, please. Ah, uh, sure. So uh, I, I guess I'll start, uh, I'll start with myself. I've uh, been with uh, Exceeding uh, a little over five years now. Uh, I spent uh, 15 years at Cisco, a company most of us uh, have heard of. Um, I did, uh, most of my time there was in uh, service provider and then supporting service providers to sell into the enterprise. Sold pretty much everything from uh, optical networking all the way up through uh, layer three, you know, routing, switching layer two, and then cybersecurity products there. And uh, prior to that, I grew up, uh, you know, out, out, right out of college and uh, started out my career as an engineer, actually. So I'm, I guess I'm going to reverse order. So I was a, an automation control and robotics engineer. And uh, somewhere around, uh, you know, eight, nine years into my career, I decided to go into the dark side, as they say. I went into sales, uh, left engineering and decided to start selling all the stuff that I was doing, you know, all the, all the, the robots and uh, everything I was building, I decided to sell it. And then I went into IT because that's where all the money was in the late 90s, going into uh, the panic of Y2K. Everybody remembers that, right? And oh, yeah. nothing, nothing happened. So. Uh, but a lot of money was uh, spent to prep for that. And uh, so that, that, that was my career. Then I went to Cisco. Uh, I did a year in uh, net, uh, you know, network virtualization and then uh, came to Exceed about five, five years ago. I, uh, 
Yeah, and uh, Exceedian, uh, interesting story. So they're uh, about a 17-year-old company now. Uh, started out working with service providers to help them uh, do service assurance and basically monitor their networks uh, which, with you know, kind of ultra accurate, uh, ultra granular technology. That was their, you know, basically segue into the market. Uh, they have, you know, probably over 50 patents here around that sort of technology and hardware. And then about five years ago, six years ago, transitioned into software as a company starting to virtualize our solutions and uh, basically disaggregate the, disaggregate the control plane, data plane. And uh, about three years ago, I led us on an acquisition to be able to go all the way up the stack in terms of monitoring all the way up to layer seven. Um, and then about two years ago, I basically, uh, I would say, looked at our technology with the help of a couple of customers who said, my goodness, the data you collect would be just amazing if we had that for cybersecurity because you know it's hard to get this packet, this packet data as efficiently as you guys are able to extract it. And uh, so I basically incubated our cybersecurity business, and uh, that's where we are today. So awesome, awesome. So Bragant, talk a little bit about yourself, and then and sure. then tell us what Michael's not really telling us. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Uh, I appreciate the uh, the invitation to uh, to be here tonight from uh, from Jeremy, and it's great to meet you guys. Um, uh, this is Brigand Hill. I'm based in uh, in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and I've been with the city in I guess almost a year. It'll be a year next uh, next month. I come from a background having worked at uh, places like Wipro, LG, CNS. I spent some time in the uh, syndicated IT research space with a company called uh, 451 uh, Research. Uh, strong, strong background in applications development, SaaS, data center, and cloud. Uh, prior to coming to uh, a city, and I was with a company called uh, SASMAX, and we were a marketplace of probably over 250 SaaS vendors. And principally, my role was to work with uh, MSPs and MSSPs to help them understand how to take SaaS solutions and drive monthly reoccurring revenue and increase the, increase the valuation of their company. So uh, Ascidian happened to be one of my uh, uh, clients at, uh, at SASMAX and uh, started talking to Michael. It just made a lot of sense for me to, uh, to come on board. Uh, relative to Ascidian, my role is to work with our channel ecosystem, which is, which is global. We operate in about 84 uh, different uh, countries. So, um, Companies like uh, Fortify, uh, who are managed service security providers, we want them to take a look at our uh, IDS solution, which you'll hear a lot about uh, later on, to take that solution and ingest it and develop service offerings around uh, our particular uh, platform uh, with the different solutions that they have. So my days are spent uh, talking to lots of guys and gals that are like uh, like Jeremy. <laughs> so it's uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun, and um, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> now I got my you have my empathy now. <laughs> and and I, I guess the thing that I would say is we are a very well kept secret and uh, that's changing as we increase the visibility that we have in the marketplace. And I think as uh, end customers, uh, enterprises, SMB and even uh, uh, MSSPs like uh, like Jeremy, once they take a deeper look at what our technology stack is all about, they find a lot of value. Uh, it's a phenomenally run uh, uh, company, and I'm, I'm having a good time uh, working here so far. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So with that, Jeremy, why don't you lead off with the questions this evening, sir? Yeah, bro. Yeah. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> I'll put that on the, 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 the baseball tee here for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, you gave us a good background in uh, – about what a CDN is. And so let's talk about your products. Um, you have, uh, you, have, you really have, a, your, your flagship product is called Skylight, right? 
Um, and then, so yes. tell us about Skylight and then tell us about how Skylight as, is adapting into the IDS space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so I guess what I would, I would start with is when I talk about Skylight, let me take one step back. Uh, Exceedian has grown up in the network traffic analysis space. We, uh, and we are a very, you know, uh, Brigant said, you know, we're kind of a, a, a secret and that is probably a little bit more true on the enterprise space, on the service provider space uh, and in, in, that, in that market segment, uh, we're a well-known entity. Uh, probably 75% of the global tier one network operators, mobile network operators, telecom companies use us to monitor uh, their networks. So we have grown up with a rich heritage, tons of experience, some of the industries when it comes to understanding packets, packet analytics, uh, packet intelligence, network traffic. Uh, and, and basically what we did is, you know, probably about five years ago, we started to build the Skylight solution, right? And Skylight Analytics is our SaaS-based platform. Uh, it was basically architected um, to, to monitor network traffic. Now, what's interesting is, um, you know, when I look at the world of, of analytics, that I always I kind of look at it in, in, in three three tiers, right? There's the observability layer, which is the data gathering. What is the data you're going to gather? How are you going to gather it? What's the cost of gathering it? Uh, how how rich is that data? How granular? How accurate? How comprehensive is it? Is it available everywhere? And so Skylight has the capability to gather that network traffic. Uh, and I'll explain how it does that uh, from an observability level. Then there's the, you know, kind of the, the analytics and correlation level where you from that, that data. And then there's the workflow level, which is, you know, at the end of the day, what the, you know, the operations teams or the DevOps teams, uh, you know, the workflows, what they see, the monitoring, the alerts, and then the northbound APIs that, that send those to other places for, for action, right? And so we, you know, when you think about Skylight, you know, it, we leverage uh, sensor technology, uh, lightweight uh, virtualized sensors, uh, and, and they can be, they're also uh, now, uh, we're actually containerizing them as well for containerized environments to be able to go in, extract uh, the, the, what we call per packet intelligence metadata, and we bring that up into our analytics platform. Now, historically, as we grew up as a company, that that the analytics of Exceedian were around performance, performance monitoring. How is a network performing? Maybe how is an application performing? What's the packet loss? What's the latency? What's the jitter? All those sorts of interesting insights that a performance analytics uh, process and, and, and basically pattern recognition of the data will, will deliver. We, we realized several years ago through our customers that, wait a second, I would love to have just that, that sort of data to do security analytics, right? So we were talking to some of the large financials. I, I, in fact, I was talking to you know, the whole journey for exceeding into cybersecurity. It's kind of like, you know, those of you familiar with Splunk, Splunk kind of discovered that they, were, they, were a, a, they had a SIM, you know, because all their customers were ingesting law and they been using it for security. Their customers taught them that they were, and, and they discovered through their customers, they were a SIM um, and, or could be used as a SIM. We were a similar, we, we discovered through our customers uh, that we were a cybersecurity company. And basically, you know, all we needed to do was, was do a different set of analytics uh, secure, and look for security patterns, right? Look for security threats rather than for performance impairments. And because of the rich data that we had and could gather, um, it was really easy for us to start, you know, to be able to make, you know, detections of security threats uh, anywhere. You know, if you look at a cyber kill chain, right? You got, you know, at the beginning, you're, you're you know, reconnaissance. There's there's protocols associated with reconnaissance, whether you know DNS or, uh, you know, DNS vulnerability probing, and then all the way through a cyber kill chain, there's there's establishment of a command control tunnel. Well, that's a, that's encryption. Well, we do encryption uh, protocol, you know, uh, decodes. And we, we look at all of the uh, protocol transactions around TLS and SSL and HTTPS. And then, you know, somebody, you know, an attacker could go in and start to begin to exfiltrate data. They could take files, they could take, they could make database queries. And so our ability to decode all of these different protocols and all these transactions at 100% uh, made it very easy for us to begin be able to 
detect uh, what normal behavior was when we saw an anomaly and or you know, some sort of uh, you know, indicator of compromise and alert on it. And so that's how we transitioned into you know, security analytics. So you know, the term is, was uh, coined a couple of years ago by Gartner Network Traffic Analysis. Typical Gartner, they've already pivoted out of network traffic analysis and now they call it network detection and response. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, I guess that's how they just keep themselves relevant, but uh, <laughs> hopefully from, <laughs> nobody from Gartner watches this video. But, uh, but yeah, we, we've been, I, I tell people, you know, you know, we've been doing network traffic analysis for 17 years. You know, we, we, we just changed the workflows and the type of analytics to security analytics. And of course, you know, we, we, we hired uh, some of the world's best security uh, engineers and security architects and, and so forth to help us to build out the detections, to build out those workflows. Uh, but, but network traffic analysis is, you know, it's in our DNA as a company. Where, so where does the, uh, where's the app, where's, are, so you have a physical appliance, you have some virtual appliances. Yep. We do everything uh, in both modes. We can do all physical or we can do all virtual and we are now starting to introduce containerized. Uh, and then, and then where do you sit in the network uh, when question. you're doing yeah. the NTA kind of stuff or the NPM, if you want to yeah, clarify yeah, that? It, yeah. yeah, yeah, the NDR or whatever they call it now or the NPM or the NTA. Uh, so we take a, we just need a mirror copy of the traffic somewhere in, in the flow of the, of the traffic. And so we could, uh, if you imagine, uh, you know, any, any sort of choke point where we can get a copy of that through a span port, tap port, if, in a, if you're in a virtual environment, a vSwitch port, uh, in a containerized environment, we have some different technology that, that we're starting to, to leverage right now around that to get a copy of the traffic. Containers are a little bit different. Uh, it's more challenging because you have the dynamic identity uh, and, you, you know, you have, you have to begin to associate, uh, you know, IP addresses are ephemeral. So, the traditional way of doing network traffic analysis in a virtualized environment where a, you know, an IP address is nailed up uh, and, and pinned to a certain uh, asset, a resource that, that changes all, it's all out the window in, in you know, K8 Kubernetes environments or, or containerized environments. So, uh, but, but at the end of the day, we need a copy of the traffic. Um, you know, I kind of like to use the illustration of protecting a city, um, you know, in a, in a city, you know, you've got a few roads and a few highways that, that allow traffic in. Uh, you don't need to monitor every road in the city, right? We just need to monitor the, the roads in and, you know, we can get all the information, all the pack per packet intel. And then if there are places within the city that you want to monitor because you have critical assets, uh, then we, we drop our sensors inside that environment and we can monitor inside the environment as well. Uh, we, you know, it's interesting, our business model, our commercial model is we don't charge for our sensors. They're all, you know, if they're all software, if they're not physical appliances. Um, if you, you know, you can stand up as many sensors as you need in that. And of course, now we have to consider the world we're in with digital transformation. Most, most companies have some sort of hybrid architecture. They have, they're leveraging public cloud, private data center, maybe infrastructure as a service, multi-cloud, right? A lot of the larger enterprises are doing, you know, a little Google Cloud, a little AWS, a little Azure, some of my own data center. Uh, those sorts of complex um, distributed infrastructure environments are where Exceedance technology uh, really finds its strength and really uh, kind of pulls ahead of the pack. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a sport, right? Where... <laughs> You know, I think of climbers, you know, guys who have really great upper body strength make really good climbers. And, and you know, the, the, the steeper the, the, you know, the incline, the, the more they're going to pull away from the pack. It's kind of the way it is for us. The more complex the environment, uh, the more distributed the assets, the more network dependencies there are, the better, the easier it is for us to instrument compared to others and to pull that data um, into a, our, our analytics platform. And I'll tell you how we do that in just a second analyze it and then to deliver security insights. So I'm a, I'm a little bit curious that you, you mentioned Gartner earlier and looking at their peer insights, I see a, a section that I haven't really seen before and that talks to the overlap, right? So as we look at some of the other products out there like SolarWinds and, and uh, Dynatrace and Cisco and Microsoft, they talk about this percentage of overlap. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how you play nice in the sandbox in that way? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll, 
I can speak on this on a couple different fronts because of our, you know, our, our company and the fact that we're both in a, in a performance monitoring space and a cybersecurity space. I'll take the cybersecurity route because I'm assuming that's what's of most interest here. So, you know, when I look at cyber, I, I, I tend to break things out, you know, into perimeter protection, right? You know, protected the perimeter of the city. Let's go back to that illustration, that metaphor. <laughs> The end, endpoint protection, right? We're going to monitor every door, every window, right, in the city. Uh, make sure that you know nobody gets in through the do doors and windows. And then there's net, you know, the network traffic analysis part, right, which is what we do: intrusion detection. So now somebody got in, somehow they breached a wall, they tunneled under the, the you know the perimeter protection, and they're in. They stole somebody's credentials, you know, and and now they're inside. Lateral movement. How do we detect those folks? And that's really what we are. We're I call us more of a next generation IDS. And you're right, everybody, you know, everybody who has, uh, has business tries to figure out, okay, what's an adjacent market I can move to, to gr grow my revenue. So now, I'll, now I'm, a, I'm a firewall vendor. Oh, okay, well let's do next gen, uh, you know, next gen firewall. So I'll, I'll add IDS to my next gen firewall. And now I, I can move in a little bit here, right? The problem with next gen IDS is it's still pretty much signature based. Uh, what we do is behavior based, right? So, you know, when you look at intrusion detection as a uh, technology as a whole, you basically can do signature detection and you can do behavior based intrusion detection. And that's, I, I call next generation, you know, behavior based intrusion detection, what Gartner called NTA, which now Gartner calls NDR, and next year they'll call it something else. So, at the end of the day, we're looking at the threats that get past the perimeter. Um, and a lot of times endpoint, you know, endpoints only effective if you can put an, uh, you know, an agent on the endpoint. There are a lot of endpoints you can't put an agent on. Um, you know, uh, IoT is an attack vector. You can't, you know, a lot of IoT devices, there's no OS that's accessible, right? Uh, industrial control systems, uh, manufacturing, a lot of those are closed operating systems. I grew up in automation and, and controls systems, and I know that. Um, you know, BYOD, someone walks into your environment, you, you know, they don't have a... Uh, they, they don't have your endpoint protection on there. So, uh, and then you have to manage it properly, configure it properly. You can't make any mistakes because all it takes is one window, one door to be open and someone to find it and they're inside. And you did, you know, 99.9%, .9%, you're 99.9% .9 successful and you still fail. Right. When, when I was at school, 99.9 .9 was, you know, a, a, a plus, I was really happy, right? In cyber, that's an F. Uh, <laughs> so that's a big fail. So network traffic analysis says, you know, instead of trying to monitor, you know, thousands of windows and thousands of doors, I monitor a couple of rows and then I see everything, right? Because every single attack has to hit the network. It always, there's always a network footprint. So in terms of bleeding over, you know, you, you know, most of the endpoint companies um, generally will partner with somebody like uh, an Expedia, a network, uh, you know, an NTA company or an NDR company. Uh, the perimeter players, uh, you know, and I, I work for Cisco, you know, somebody like a Cisco, they're going to have, they're going to have a product for everything pretty much, right? They have, they have, uh, you know, Stealth Watch, which is a NDR. They have all, obviously all their firewalls and so forth, security gateways and routers and everything else. So um, there is always, uh, there is technology overlap and there are, there is what vendors do to try to, you know, basically expand their portfolio and cover new areas to grow their revenue. Um, and, and we see all that, right? Um, what we do, we do very well. Um, you know, we don't, we're not gonna go into the firewall business. You know, we're not gonna go into the endpoint business necessarily. Although we, we do have some technology to, to uh, deal with encrypted traffic, which is becoming more of an issue. And we have some really cool technology now we're implementing around uh, being able to decrypt, for example, TLS 1.3, which is the problem. Yeah, I'm because, hearing a lot about that 1.3. Yeah, so we've got some amazing technology right now we're implementing to decrypt 1.3. Um, and we can do that. Uh, you know, we, we don't need, you know, anybody's uh, keys or anything like that. We have some pretty cool technology to do that we could talk more about. Uh, but basically now that, that opens us up you know, opens up again for us to be able to, to see inside those environments and, and not be blind. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of what we do and, and uh, you know, where we see, you know, uh, technology bleeding over. Um, it, it absolutely happens in, in security. And of course, now you're starting to see, you know, like, uh, you know, SASE, SASE, you know, pop up and it's, 
you know, just a, you know, a, a link into a cloud and all your security stuff is in there. And, you know, before that, uh, you know, zero trust networks, you know, there's always some new approach to trying to protect yourself at the end of the day. Um, you know, the goal is to, in cybersecurity, in my opinion, is if you have the budget, it's, it's not, is it belts or is it braces? It's belts and braces. You put it all on, um, you know, get, if I'm jumping out of an airplane, you know, give me three parachutes. <laughs> don't let me just, don't force me to pick the, the best one. Just give me three. You know, I want all three. So, so analytics, brought up analytics a number of times. So where are you seeing analytics in the future? So in the past, we've done a lot of statistical modeling. Yes. Right? And uh, Google has been pushing frequency as, as, a, as a particular type of model. Are you seeing, I hate to use the concept of AI or machine learning, but are, are you looking at those type of analytics? Or yep. are you thinking that analytics of those types don't scale well, or what's, what, what's your what's your analysis so far? Of different sure, areas? sure. Yeah, it's funny you ask. You know, I, I did a master's. Uh, God, God, I hate to even say this over over twenty five years ago, but uh, uh -huh. it, my mass I, I was a I was an electrical engineer. I did a, my minor was in statistics back then, and I I hated statistics at the time. Um, but uh, you know, the way I look at it is. You know, machine learning and, and training models, there, there's a reason you do machine learning is if you don't understand the relationships of, of the of the data and you don't know what you're looking for and you want, you know, uh, you know, basically a machine to help you understand what the relationships are within your data set. That's where you leverage machine learning very well. And there are absolutely uh, we leverage machine learning. Uh, for uh, certain types of alerts, for example, ransomware, we've trained models to recognize ransomware patterns um, in in a certain you know data set. Now we have a rich data set at Exceed. We we extract you know metadata from the packet, and we're seeing uh, you know probably a dozen different protocols at least you know a hundred percent of all that data. So we have a very rich data set. If your data set is compressed and you you have a limited data set then you're, uh, you have to leverage machine learning more because you don't have as, as much data to analyze. And so you have to do more about, you have to infer more. Um, but if I can, if, if for, I'll give you a great example of this. Um, you know, take a, take a SQL injection attack, right? If I can't see HTTP and, and SQL trend, uh, transactions, I may miss a SQL injection attack. But if I, you know, if, if I if I don't, see, the only way I might be able to pick that up is to, to model what normal behavior looks like and then look for an anomaly. The problem with that is you're going to get a lot of false positives, right? Because not everything that is not anomalous is malicious and not everything that is malicious is anomalous. Uh, so the, the richer your data set, the less you have to rely on what I refer to as inferring on the data. Um, we leverage a lot of statistical methods um, and, and statistics are fine. You know, and statistics are fine when you have the right data set. If you don't have the right data set, then it's really hard. But for example, you know, if I'm looking to, to, at, at TLS, for example, TLS uh, transactions, um, it's, I can leverage statistical methods and I could flag a, new, a newly observed tunnel uh, or something that looks abnormal just statistically. I don't need to train machine learning models to do that because I, I have the I have the data. If I don't have that uh, that, that protocol transaction uh, data set, then I have to do more machine learning, right? So it's it's all of, it, your data set really determines, and the richness of your data set is going to determine the degree to which you need machine learning and AI. Um, but if you you know when you introduce machine learning, when you introduce AI, you know you do ramp up. A, you move more into the probability realm and with the more and, and that's where you get more and more false positives and when that's multiplied at scale over time that's where you get sock fatigue right because now your sock analysts are getting you know it doesn't mean there's not legitimate alerts in there it's just they're 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 trying to hammer through you know you know hundreds of alerts to, to get to the one that's actually real and in and, and, and i think that's so i think uh you know, the richer your data set is, the less reliant you have to be on machine learning, but machine learning will always have a place. And, and I think it, it can, you know, do the computations at speeds humans just can't. 
Because we're gone today, so you're here, bro. And you just heard it in the conversation of sock fatigue. I love that because, you know, sock guys that work all night long, they want to sleep anyways when they start their job. So that was <laughs> the issue with, with sock fatigue. It's natural. But, I mean, is that one of the things you talk about in the channel when you engage people is, like, what's your main selling point? So you're engaging it, somebody. It, you got it, all these analytics. You know yeah, it, 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 well, it, it's, it, it's a good point to bring that up. I was just, I was just talking to a company today and their, their primary business. So, so we can go down another level. It's the, the SOC as a service guys. They're a great potential target for our technology stack because typically they've got the network and the, uh, the SIM skills to be able to do the integration. Um, give me an example. Uh, Wait, talking you, four to, four to five, four to seven. Say again. Stock. <laughs> um, so, so I was talking to uh, to someone from uh, a company. They have Alien Vault, right? And um, yeah. they they like Alien Vault sock services, right? They're thirty. They've got a thirty six month deal with uh, with Alien Vault, but they're twenty two months into that, and they're thinking about, hey, we don't want their sim though. We don't like their SIM solution, right? Well, I, could have, I could have told them that after month one, but go on. <laughs> yeah, ex 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 exactly. Because I, I was literally, so take a sense of because because up to this point, Mike's been talking. I've been thinking, we just call them bands, right? Big ass networks. I see you guys on those type of things, right? I don't see you guys on the mom and pop shops. I see you guys like dealing with Arbor or Fluke less than I see you guys dealing with Cisco, right? I see you guys dealing with the big boys. So here's, 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 here's what I'll say. Yeah. What we, what's, what's happening is because it's also network performance and security, mm -hmm. you're starting to see, for example, you have a lot of, particularly in healthcare, a lot of the services are going to the edge through telemedicine and things like that. So you've got these multi-location radiology practices, right? That are sending uh, picture archive and, and, and x-rays across the network and so forth. So their performance security is big and that's just proliferating uh, across, the, uh, across the board. Also logistics companies. So, and some of those you would consider SMB. They may be at the higher end of the SMB, mm -hmm. but it, it just depends on where you draw that uh, draw that line. So the use cases are up and down the um, uh, the enterprise down into the uh, the lower uh, uh, mid market. Okay. We, we've got um, well, Goya is a, a huge company, but the uh, the CIO from Goya was on our um, our summit a few weeks ago. We had a summit for all our customers and our partners and. What they're doing with some of our performance stuff, and they don't compared to some of the other big companies that you would know, their their network's not enormous, but it's 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 big. It's it's not you know. Uh, I think of them about black beans. I really don't think about Goya. Yeah. Like, no, but, uh. we, we had some good conversations about that. The, the, the presentation was awesome. I'll, I'll try to get you guys a copy of that. But, you know, we have the the the, the MSSPs that I'm talking to. They tend to be the larger ones, but like Jeremy's, we're working on something now, and you, you know the size of his company. So yeah, it's it going to be does, big. Jeremy yeah. doesn't know it. It's getting bigger every time we, we, we go out. It, 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 well, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and then, I just uh, one comment in there. I mean, because we're a software based solution and because we don't charge for our sensors, exactly you know, for a mid market or a smaller account, we're, we're perfect for them, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. we, we can capture all their traffic with a with the software sensor. We don't we don't require if they if they can give us a, a VM on a you know a couple cores on a server in their environment, um, we can feed that up into our SaaS platform and boom, we're up and running with visibility and security threat detection. So yeah, in in the old world of where you had to have hardware to do everything, um, the hardware cost could price you out of a deal. In the world we're in now, with, with where things can be software and you can leverage SaaS. Uh, we can price ourselves, you know, pretty much to, to you know, the, the you know, SMB, mid-market, large enterprise, all the way up to service provider, right? It's, we, we try to, you know, basically price on a consumption-based model. And so, you know, if you consume a little, you pay a little. If you consume a lot, you pay a lot, right? And so it's, 
you know, we're not a big heavy metal, you know, kind of hardware company where you need five of these modules here and three of these modules here and can't even get into the door for less than $250,000 or something, right? So uh, we're, we're subscription-based, you know, uh, so, so we could pretty much, I, you know, address and for an MSP or, you know, a managed, uh, you know, uh, defense response, um, you know, you, you can leverage our technology and literally just drop sensors out at your customer locations and get visibility like that. So, so, um, so go back to Brown, so, so you're saying these guys had alien vault, right? You're trying to get rid of alien vault. They're only had for 11 months or whatever, right? You guys are working with them. So go on with the story. So what, what happened there? So they're, they're a hospital and, um, they they felt like they were getting a lot of false positives coming out of uh, out of alien ball, and that was causing a lot of burnout with the um, with the side yeah. So so some so he was looking for a way to kind of hey, can I get rid of some of this these false positives? And inc incidentally, the other area is we're not we're not running around saying hey install our stack and you're not going to be you're not going to ever get hacked right that that's a, a a premise that a lot of vendors are saying right so we're saying we're giving you some defensive capability and we give you all this visibility but guess what should you get hacked we give you the ability to put together the forensic after action report, which is critical because what happens now, most companies get hacked and in parachutes, a bunch of experts to tell them what happened and the company doesn't know what happened and they can't report to their shareholders anything that makes sense. They can't report to law enforcement. Their or they're in, a, or they're in a negotiation or they're in a negotiation with the ransomware attacker, exactly. right? And, and they, gotta, they don't know the extent of the damage and so, you know, they have no, they have no negotiation control. Um, yeah, we're, we're quite familiar with that. We see, we engage a lot of clients these days who have experienced ransomware and, and they're, they're fraught trying to figure out what can they do to protect themselves, yeah. right? And that's where we engage and, and help them with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you look at the integration with uh, SIM tools, right? So you, you've obviously probably have some of that in play today. Uh, how, how do you technically integrate with them uh, today and then yeah. take advantage of your analytics? Sure. So we have northbound APIs that can do a number of things, right? So first of all, we could go straight into a SIM and just provide alerts. We, you know, that's not a problem at all. Uh, the second thing is we have in, we've done northbound integrations into some of the uh, SOAR player, you know, Phantom Domesto. Uh, so if you want to actually take it, you know, feed it into, a, you know, an or or orchestration and response platform, we could do that. Uh, you know, we've written uh, you know, scripts to go out of our API into firewalls to block and, you know, us, you know, IP addresses. So there's, you know, with the northbound APIs, you know, we basically can tie into any platform and, and basically feather in and weave our way into whatever the security policy is of the, of the organization, right? Whether they want to take an action uh, based on a certain threat level or whether they, you know, obviously, if you see a malicious IP address in your environment, you probably just want to you know, slam the door on it, right? And stop it, block it. Um, there are other types of threats that you might, you know, from a business continuity and resiliency perspective, say, I might want to investigate that first before I, you know, take an action. So again, we'll feed into whatever those uh, northbound, you know, policy and orchestration platforms are to, uh, and, and SIMS to, you know, we're actually, uh, Splunk actually is, uh, 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 you know, we're a Splunk partner, we have actually a Splunk-based app uh, that you can download with a lot of our detections and alerts in it. Uh, they're built right into Splunk. So all the detections, all the analytics are we built inside of Splunk, uh, which is how we incubated our entire cybersecurity product uh, because the customer that the, the large financial institution that wanted our data said, hey, I use Splunk. Can you do this in Splunk? We're like, yeah, we can, we can use Splunk. Um, and so, you know, but uh, being a Splunk partner, they, they saw what we were doing and basically invited us into their uh, Splunk Security Essentials. And uh, we were the only other vendor outside of Splunk themselves that published alerts and detections inside of Essentials. So, you know, we absolutely can play, um, you know, horizontally and vertically with, you know, with an entire cybersecurity portfolio. Okay. Yeah, normally we'd see uh, Q Radar, Elastic, Splunk as the... Yeah, 
the normal sims that we usually would see out there that people ask yeah, us anyway to. Exactly, exactly. Logarithms, some of the other ones. But yeah, I mean, again, we're agnostic to us. That doesn't, that's just the northbound target for our API. All right, Mr. Tao. You're not drinking, you're not, you're not asking questions. What's up with you? Well, I'm 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 trying to pace myself. This was a uh, <laughs> this was a tall boy anyway to start with, right? And it's a uh, 7.9 percent. So there you go. You guys have an interesting uh, little tool that you guys now called ants. Yeah. What do, what do the ants do? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. The ants, yeah, so, yeah. So we have we have nanos and we have ants. Um, so the the uh, on the performance monitoring side, we use ants uh, or nanos. These are basically um, ele network elements that you can stick. Uh, let's say they terminate a service. Uh, it could be an Ethernet service, for example. Um, and what they do is they have all of our performance monitoring, uh, you know, endpoint technology in it. So when I want to, I want to run a test to understand what the the latency is, the the packet loss, the jitter. We we deliver over a hundred performance monitoring networks. We again, we 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 all, we pretty much invented that space uh, at Exceedian and. Um, uh, in addition to that, you can run what, what is called a service activation test. So you could basically, you know, it's called a birth certificate when you're, you know, commissioning a network if you're a service provider. So, so the ant modules are uh, actual elements that, that, you know, are powered up and uh, one gig, 10 gig, and they basically do network service termination. Uh, we also have what are called little SFPs that we used to call them nanos. I don't, I, 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 don't, I don't even know what we call them anymore. I don't, uh, I haven't conferred with marketing, but Anyhow, these little SFPs, they're one gig era and, and 10 gig now. They do the same thing. They do service termination. What's really cool about them, though, is you can actually, and the same thing is true for the uh, AMP modules, is you can actually program them uh, through their controller to block IP addresses. So you can block TCP uh, ports. You can block IPs. So that can actually be a secure, a, a really cheap uh, FPGA-based uh, little mini firewall. So imagine now you have a, a bunch of critical asset servers. You take these, uh, you know, these F SFPs, plug them in, and if you have a, all of a sudden your security analytics determines I've got a threat, uh, or I've got a malicious IP, or, or somebody's, you know, uh, you know, hitting a server, you can literally block it at the server with those SFPs. So, um, you know, from a security perspective, they can do that. From a performance perspective, they give us all the performance monitoring, uh, you know, metrics that, you know, again, tell you what your network health is and really do uh, service assurance. So as you look out three years from now, Mike, how do you say that you've been successful with the cybersecurity efforts you're doing? Uh, if I look out three years from now, I would say, you know, the first, the first thing I would say is, you know, were we tuned into the customer? Were we tuned into our customer base and, and to what is, you know, what the real needs are, right? You know, a lot of times, um, you know, we think we, we try to outsmart everybody. I think, you know, I've learned the best, the best, um, the best way to be successful is to, is to shut up and really listen to what your customers needs are, where their pain is and the problems that they're struggling with and really, really try to address those. So I, I would say, you know, from a, that, that's really, that's philosophical, right? So let me get practical. We're, we're moving into a world that's becoming more and more disaggregated. Software is becoming, you know, you know, networks are becoming disaggregated. 5G is on is coming. The 5G edge will be disaggregated. RAN will be disaggregated. Mobile cores will be disaggregated. We're seeing the convergence of industry and uh you know team for one have to have uh, and we as to be successful you know technology that can function across a distributed uh disaggregated you know end-to-end -end type of environment that might involve you know multiple domain visibility they 
one over public over uh, you know partnered with this carrier over here then there's a you know second it goes to you know uh you know equinox or someone like that and then it and, it and it just moves on to a third carrier and to another cloud provider and then it hits a private data center and then it hits a, a, a user over here getting that end-to-end -end visibility uh, and being able to what i call instrument that sort of environment is going to be critical we have the fundamental building blocks today to address that um, I think for us, it's going to be about execution. And, you know, it's also, you know, Brigham brought up something that's important. Um, it's foolish to think that you're not going to get, you know, hacked at some point. I think you have to assume you're going to get hacked and you have to have the tools in place, right, to, to be able to address that from an incident response perspective. And having the data available to you to be able to, number one, I, you know, identify the threat quickly, stop it and then understand very quickly what was taken. Uh, if you're in that initial negotiation with somebody, if it's a ransomware attack or a hacker, you know what the real risk is. If he's asking for $10 million or $5 million or $2 million, and you know that everything he took is, is not even maybe third-party data. Maybe it's, it's, he's just, you know, yeah, he got in, he got data, but it's not, it's not critical data. You know how to handle that situation, right? Um, and you also know how to handle it from a, you know, a reporting perspective and a regulatory perspective. So I think, um, you know, for us, to, honestly, for, you know, two, three years out for us to be successful, obviously you want to continue to sharpen your analytics. Uh, you want to always stay, you know, ahead, but let's face it, you know, um, the, the cyber criminals that are out there, they're, you know, especially APTs, they're well funded, they're, they're well organized. Most small businesses can't compete with them. They don't have the resources. Companies like yourselves, they need, right? Because you you do bring a force with you um, and you, you, bring, you bring an army of experts with you. So, you know, to me, I think um, the market is going to move more toward uh, your business model. And for us to be successful, we need to give you the tools you need to be successful. I really believe that case. I think, you know, obviously the, the Fortune 1000, they're going to to have their socks and so forth but i think we're going to see more and more outsourcing and then a lot of companies who unfortunately because they haven't paid attention to cybersecurity and took it for granted that i'm a small company no no one's interested in me i'm only 50 people 100 people 300 people 500 people you know what they don't realize is you know they're the easiest of targets because they're the you know, they're, they're the least offensive right and, well, and they're going to need to turn to more and more companies like yourself yeah to that point you know, we constantly are are coming across companies that might be a thousand plus employees mm -hmm. that literally do not have a cyber governance plan in place. Isn't and it now, stunning? It, it's it stunning. is stunning too, but, uh, very stunning. And, and I think if they were to really open up their kimono and talk the truth, you'd find out, yeah, they've been breached, Yeah, but they oh, still don't. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, the average time to even detect a breach is over 200 days now or whatever. So no, uh, they don't even know it a lot of times. So I'm, I'm curious, as you talked about the data coming in, that, that's a lot of data coming in. And you talked about your analytics and your alerting. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's, it's metadata. So it's about one one hundredth of the overall traffic, right? Uh, so we don't, we don't bring in all the packets. That is economically unviable and operationally un, you know, unfeasible, right? You can't, especially in the world of cloud and multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, you can't be moving full packet captures around. Number one, your network, you'll have to, you basically have to create mirror networks for all that. You know, if I have a gig of traffic and I want to move a gig of traffic to go analyze it, that means I need two one gig pipes. So we use metadata, it's about one. And so there, we just move, use the same production network. Uh, and the, what Regan said earlier, which is, you know, having that data there for forensics, you, you know, that means you can retain the data for longer, right? So what I used to be able to store on disk for one month, now I could store for a hundred months, you know? So I'll, we, we totally disrupted the entire economic model for not just detection, but forensics. Uh, and again, we're not sampling, we're not topping, we're not averaging, we're not taking, we're, we're it, this is 100% packet analytics. We don't, we don't sample packets, it's 100% of the packets. So you see, hundred percent of the flow. And because we're looking at it, you know, in a time series, it, we're correlating events, you know, over time when we do our analytics and everything's timestamped. So 
we don't have to go and assemble logs from all over the place and try to stitch them together. That's why Sims, and that's why there's so much false positive, right? In, in, in a, when, it, when you're a Sim-based, uh, you know, environment, because you're, you're trying to pull, first of all, logs, logs, log data is, you know, not what I would call ultra granular. It's, it's, it's quite coarse. It's a lot of the data that we acquire is not even available. Um, you're not going to see SQL transactions and things like that. I mean, you, you know, the, the data that the logs you pull out of the public cloud, for example, are, you know, it's a nightmare to deal with all that and they're not as rich. Uh, so again, packet Intel data is the truest data, right? And that's what we acquire. Uh, but okay, we, yeah. we definitely understand about that because a lot of times what we see with our com competition, right, is they're going to take that data and put it into a data lake. Yep. Now our philosophy is, well, it's too late by then, right? So we take and we literally do what we call uh, uh, you know, streaming rivers, if you will, right? Where it's live streaming data coming in and we're going to do that that user and entity behavior analytics on it, on right? It, yeah. and, and add on that incremental yeah. intelligence on the fly before we even write it to our database, right? That's exactly what we, exactly. That we do the same thing with Skylight Analytics. It's It's a streaming analytics platform, real time. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm certainly hoping that, uh, uh, you know, post this discussion that we get our teams together and look at how we might be able to work together as well. Yeah, we're going to put them on the, the voting machines. I mean, they could definitely use them in North and South Carolina and Georgia. Well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Some help. <laughs> All right. So, Jeremy, any other thoughts? I, I just want to compliment the again. This hat fits really well. Yeah, that looks good. That's good. <laughs> and it Come just on, I like that. I'm, I'm jealous. To... I worry. I'm like, man, where'd you where'd you get that hat? I wish I had one of those. I, don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I listened to you guys talk, and you guys gave me a hat for that. So there you go. There you go. So Chris, Chris, what's your guitar there? Which uh, what kind of guitar is that? That's uh, the one you see closer. That's a custom 24. That's a PRS custom 24. I got my Les Paul 24 here. Please, McCarthy oh, model. Wow. Nice. Then, oh, okay. Uh, I got a. Do you have an acoustic? Keyboard. I can't. I can't tell. Is that an acoustic right there? I've got an acoustic. I've got an ovation and a Westwood. But, oh, okay. Uh, you know, these are all hard bodies. Um, I don't have any. I've you must a, be a real guitar player. See, I had a, I had a Taylor uh, acoustic, and then I I sold it because I realized I really can't play guitar. Uh, I don't yeah. deserve. I don't deserve a Taylor. I had to. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> the Martins are obviously are the great acoustics, um, but here we have uh, Paul Reed Smith with, up in Maryland, and oh, okay. uh, they just came out with a great acoustic series. Maybe we get PRS down here. We could talk security with them, uh, Jeremy. I have no clue how we can tie those two together, but, hey, but guitar uh, designs have to be, uh, you know, protected. That's intellectual property. Someone's got to. Uh, uh, you know, what? we could just drink and we could just listen and, and just listen to them play. Santana. They got Santana. I, I saw uh, Living Color plays PRSs now. Yeah. Band Aid, the uh, band made. I'm sorry, the band, uh, the. Uh, the, the the Japanese big girl band that dresses up as maids, uh, their their lead guitar is a PRS player. Anyways, uh, see Mike, you've you've got you found Chris's talking point there. <laughs> <Great job. laughs> but I was actually going to go down the the barbecue things because we got a North Carolina guy here. I don't know if you're a vinegar barbecue guy. Vinegar, or you, yeah, so, yeah, tomato so, base. So it's, interesting story. So. See? Um, so my dad is uh, from South Carolina. My mother's from North Carolina. Oh my gosh! So, so but my, but my, but so my so dad. Fast Republicans. <laughs> so 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 check this out. My dad was U.S. Army, so we oh. lived all over, and yeah. I like Texas barbecue better than I like North You're Carolina crabby, barbecue. Man. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! <laughs> I, I like the I like beef barbecue. Better than I like pork barbecue. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. And my, my, my parents always cook pork barbecue, but I'd be like, I don't want that. And they're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> now, now, I have to say, since since we raise uh, exotic deer like Axis deer, Saika, uh -huh. uh, wait until you try some, um, some uh, venison uh, barbecue. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow, I've, I've never had that. Before. 
My wow. sister lives in Houston, so in fact, I'm I'm supposed to go there for uh for Christmas. Where he's, you know, he's only an hour out of Houston. <laughs> oh really? Oh okay. <laughs> and there's uh, you know the whole thing about like Texas. I mean they they have we were talking earlier today. They they all have beautiful backyards where they have a TV and a smoker. It's guaranteed yeah, yeah. those two things yeah. are in your backyard, or you're not in Texas. That is not the gun range. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, we have the acreage. You've got a gun range everywhere, so that doesn't matter. The best part is you, you drive into Texas. If, if you don't have a gun with you, they give you one. That's what's <laughs> wonderful about Texas. So, so, it's like going to Alaska. I was I was telling Jeremy a while ago, and this was the story I was going to tell you, Jeremy. I was um I was a medic in the uh, in the army, and um, I was with a. Uh, a field artillery unit and we're out on a um well they sent me to a school called platoon leadership development course and it's all the small arm tactic stuff and everything so i find myself up on the point and i'm like leading everybody through this obstacle course and you know we got the miles gear on which is the laser tag stuff and everything so all of a sudden i just i hold up my arm my, my fist like this i'm a medic right i'm in a non offensive position under Geneva Convention, right? I'm not even supposed to be up there, right? But the instructor doesn't know that. So I'm in the front and this guy just kind of opens up on us with a with a machine gun and I see him and I get everybody down and I'm like, open fire. And the instructor comes running up. He goes, that's a damn good job. You just saved the lives of your men. He goes, that's the way to go. 11 Bravo, which is infantryman, right? And I go, I'm not an infantryman. I'm a medic. He goes, oh my God. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> my old man was an army lifer. So, wow. and then of course, I, I was a Navy guy. So. What, is, oh, okay. what, is the, uh, what is the POS of a medic? The the, 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 the your, with, yeah, what are you? What oh, are you? It was it was it was ninety it was ninety one Bravo when I was in its its seventy six whiskey now or something like that. It's in healthcare. 76, I thought seventy six was biochem. Well, they changed them all. They changed they changed them all. <laughs> It's it, they, it's now you're a healthcare specialist. You're not a you're not a combat medic anymore. Well, you know, listen, I'm going to I'm going to take the conversation back. And, oh, I'm sorry. And, and, you know, but I'm, no, I got, it, you raise a good question. So so, Mike, it, obviously, we're talking about the military here and field engagements and stuff. How how entrenched are you with our military in terms of your solution? You know, because it's uh, right now fairly new for us. Yeah, you know, we're bringing it to market in uh, in the last year. Uh, we, we haven't made, you know, obviously that's a, uh, uh, a pretty long journey to get, you know, embedded in with, uh, you know, defense and, and, and our military and, you know, government agencies, let's just say the government, the fed government and all that. Um, so we haven't, uh, really ventured much into that space yet. Um, I'm trying to think if we have any particular, engagements right now i'm not aware of any at the moment okay. yeah so so michael i could tell you um just recently um uh army and air force exchange has reached out to us so, okay yeah, yeah that's just very recent though now, and of course my next question has to be with the new space force have you guys done anything with satellites and the communications yeah not not at this point no Hmm. It seems to me that that's becoming more and more important in, in our field of engagement as our as we look at our military capability. Yeah, uh, what's your, yeah, what's your basic sure. stack though? Your basic stack was like TCPIP or are you, are you ES7s? What, what, what's your stacks that you know? Uh, our stack? Yeah, what's your stack? Like, are you... TCP IP based. Mostly. Well, we go from, t so we go, for, we look at TCP trans, TCP IP transactions all the way up to layer seven transactions. Right? Okay, you don't do SIP protocols or ES7 protocols or the other protocols out there? Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for the performance side, we would look at SIP. Yeah. Um, we, you know, so we do SIP monitoring for sure. We do SIP decodes. Um, we don't use SIP that I'm aware of for cyber, but we use SIP for performance. For performance for mobile. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, from a cyber perspective, we're looking at, you know, basically the application delivery protocols that an attacker will leverage for an attack. 
Awesome. Well, listen, we, we've hit the top of the hour here now uh, with the show. We, you know, uh, we've been counseled that we don't necessarily want to go. We're counseled that we should only do 20 yeah. minutes and that people really, listen, at this point here, yeah. anybody who's got this far, they deserve something. We should send them there you go. We, we, we. <laughs> Jeremy's going to send them a hat. There you go. There you go. Not this, this hat. Jeremy, send me your exceeding hat. I can't get one of those. <laughs> hey, I, I don't have one either. <laughs> <Tell me. laughs> bro, bro's got a hat I don't even have. It's towel so, power. So listen, Michael and Brigitte, we really sincerely appreciate it. It sounds like you've got an awesome product here uh, that that really is making a difference in the market. And, and that's that. Anything we can do to help our companies in our USA, right? Yeah, to protect absolutely. itself, I think is very critical. Great. Great. Yeah, we'd love to love to collaborate with you guys, and yeah. anything we could do, uh, you know, let's do it. Certainly.